we can see you, sir. We can Okay, so let's start. Uh, we are at uh, end of time. Uh, uh, let's start. Uh, okay, so good afternoon, uh, everyone uh, in India. And uh, anyone, yes, uh, good morning. And uh, thank you, first of all, Mr. Uh, Hemant uh, Yadav, for inviting me here. Uh, the, the privilege to be a part of this virtual platform and it's been a really interesting time uh, because uh, uh, we are uh, now getting used to speaking to uh, a computer monitor uh, and then imagine a lot of people all over the world. Okay. So, uh, in any case, uh, thank you for uh, coming in today, or uh, tuning in today. Uh, I'll be talking, uh, as Professor Jadu mentioned, about uh, CAD in drug uh, discovery, choice of tools with the case study. How about uh, an interesting and unappealing title, uh, but uh, I, I thought of making it very uh, matter of fact in terms of uh, uh, what we want to do. Uh, molecular modeling is a lot more than uh, you know just using different tools uh, and then coming up with uh, a, a fancy hypothesis. Uh, hey, I think uh, it's, it's a very, very, very useful and impactful tool if used in the right way that can impact the uh, experimental practice. So today, what I will do is uh, over the course of time, uh, I will present a couple of case studies of uh, how. Uh, if I, I have used uh, different tools uh, in different uh, contexts, okay. And also I will show a couple of examples from literature as to how uh, those tools were used uh, effectively, okay. So with that, uh, let me go on to the uh, next. Yeah. So, uh, if you look at the semiconductor industry, uh, you know, their uh, predict cost uh, it's not actually predict, they actually simulate and uh, their, their modeling is not more definitive uh, because uh, the LCR circuits and all that you actually, uh, you actually estimate uh, what would be the, the transistors like and what the connection of the transistors actually work like and the same thing would be actually replicated on the silicon line. Uh, however, the simulations uh, uh, in the computer aided drug design field are actually a lot more probabilistic, rightly so, because uh, we have uh, live systems, okay, unlike the computers, we have live systems, therefore, uh, you know, uh, we cannot be uh, a, uh, uh, responding to the computer too, because I think a lot more redundancy is built into our biological system. It's very, very, very uh, difficult, uh, very, very challenging. Okay? Uh, our knowledge about the biological systems is actually growing day by day. Therefore, uh, you know, while molecular modeling was accepted as a key tool in drug discovery for a for a long time now, okay, almost I think 40, 40 years, I guess, uh, now molecular uh, modeling has been first uh, accepted in the industry as something that would be of help. Uh, it is only recently that we are seeing that uh, can we predict first, okay, that means to say that before actually doing an experiment, can we actually have a, a, a predicted outcome of what that experiment is doing, okay, and then uh, follow up with the experiment. So it will help us in several ways. One is it will actually uh, help us in, uh, you know, uh, choosing the appropriate experiment. Uh, if there are three or different types of experiments that we can do, uh, probably we can give it ourselves to what are the best shots, okay? It's all about taking the best shots at, uh, at the goal, okay? So, uh, therefore, if you see more uh, recently, like from somewhere around 2017, we have seen a paper that uh, talked about uh, predict first being, uh, that, that paper I think was from uh, Mark, okay? How they're actually employing a predict first uh, uh, approach in their registry, right? Uh, and what is uh, uh, 
uh, essential for the uh, predict first is that you need to construe drug discovery itself as a design make test segment. So in a drug discovery program, what we are actually trying to do is that we uh, design the compounds, uh, and those those designs are actually based on uh, what are the types of uh, 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 you know data that is available, okay? And what is the analysis of the data? What does it tell us? And then uh, out of 100 compounds, we make the 10 best compounds. Uh, so that's the main part of it. And then they go on to be tested in the biological system. And whatever is the outcome that we get there, uh, based on that outcome, we come back to the design and the cycle actually. In such time, a compound actually comes where, uh, you know, that satisfies most of the criteria that we found. And then that is the case and you can say the compound that they so therefore, uh, this design nature cycle is a, a very a important thing, and if we have to be part of this design nature cycle, we need to be uh, very impactful, and we need to understand the uh, uh, workflow of a drug discovery program itself very well. Uh, I, do, I, I will not uh, talk about the workflow of the drug discovery program in the beginning, but in the end, I will actually uh, uh, touch upon that in it. Right? So uh, in this cycle, we are uh, in the driver, so we are actually in the driver of the cycle because the design, it actually starts with the design. So actually the design uh, and design is the end of, end of the CAD group uh, in, in collaboration with a lot of scientists. So therefore, uh, design and hence the CAD assumes it is important. Now, what is the demand? It demands a thorough understanding of the issue. Okay, what is it that we are going to solve? Is it a, uh, is it a dramatic potential that we are going to solve? Is it a selectivity that we are going to solve? Is it a selfish uh, potency that we are trying to optimize? Okay, what is the molecular basis of? Hey, is there a molecular basis of all for this phenomenon? Okay, uh, there would be a molecular basis, but uh, do, you, do we know about that? Okay, for example, if you talk about why certain compounds behave in a certain way in the cellular assay, uh, you can have only conjecture about the molecular basis. Let's say a one nanomolar compound, uh, one nanomolar enzymatic assay is actually a telemicromolar in the cell. Hey, what could be wrong with it? Well, perhaps the compound is not permeable. Now, if the compound is not permeable, why is it not permeable? Is it very polar that it's not actually going through the membrane? Okay. So these are the type of conjectures that we actually make. Okay. So uh, one of the, there are a lot of cases, uh, places, a lot of uh, cases where we actually don't know the molecular basis. Then of course we need to take because, uh, other approaches. Okay, we'll talk about it uh, in a bit. Okay. And that pretty much uh, decides the choice of the modeling tool for this uh, What are what are be your uh, choice uh, of the tool? Uh, the critical considerations uh, for CAD to be successful is uh, enough data, okay? And uh, enough data actually depends again uh, on the technique used in the issue, okay? Uh, what is actually enough data? Uh, but uh, more than enough, enough data, you also need a sufficient range of data. For example, uh, trying to explain this on either a talking form or a uh, you know, on a QSI model. You actually need compounds ranging from micromother all the way to nanomoles. So that you are able to know that, you are able to pinpoint when I make this difference, this change, the activity is actually going in this particular direction. Most of you would be well versed to take your shared models where uh, your uh, error in prediction itself would be about say half margin. Now, if you have only say one or two orders of data, Already a fourth of that is actually the error in your face. Okay, so therefore, uh, you know, the predictive ability of your model actually goes down a lot more, right? So, uh, hence, the wider range of data up to three to three and a half orders is actually would be very useful so that you can actually take, uh, you know, compounds that are separated by say one and a half orders and then able to pinpoint what are the structural uh, parts of either the small molecule or of the protein that is actually uh, this difference in activity. So therefore, uh, when you start any particular program, you just question yourself, do you have enough data and do you have sufficient range of data? 
when you are working in new transmission programs, often you may not have enough data. So that is when uh, you simply need to actually uh, generate enough data, right? Uh, so that you have uh, enough data so that you can make models and you can actually progress uh, more meaningfully. Now, uh, there are a number of categories. I don't mean to be very exhaustive here, uh, but uh, you know, uh, our practice query program itself, we, uh, in the digital lead phase, we actually can uh, broadly define, divide it into these stages. One is once you have a target, you once you decide to work on a target, you actually do what we call a generation. Okay, where you are looking at a large number of compounds, uh, which are uh, potentially binding to this target, okay? And then uh, uh, once you have identified a smaller set of compounds as potential is, you are trying to see what, how you could actually modify those compounds, these compounds. And once those compounds become big, how you are actually optimize them further. In case of optimization, all the host of other properties that uh, you know, all the speakers in the morning uh, touched upon, like the uh, more you can just touch upon like a compound in other It's to satisfy a lot of different uh, parameters. So that's what actually makes it, uh, makes it an optimized way, right? So uh, we are helped by a number of CAD tools in each of these states. Uh, they say molecular docking, everybody is very familiar with it. Okay. Uh, then we have the molecular dynamics, then we have the disk, heavy policy modeling, learning, uh, which is getting a lot of uh, steel of that. Uh, QSR models, uh, the traditional QSR models, the uh, machine learning based QSR models, then the confirmational structures of this form of QSR. The, uh, the very, very yeah. I think uh, that's actually a very, very important to get a system. Then you have the Israel energy perturbation theory, uh, and, uh, what we do start the morning. Then there are a lot of informatics uh, configurations, like both the mathematics and the mathematics. Uh, then you could always uh, you think of your compound as a form of four, and then uh, look at one of the common forms for any given uh, uh, for a given target, uh, and then try to make on to satisfy those features. Uh, uh, right? So these are the number of uh, uh, tools that are available in our repertoire, okay? and they range for some purely classical force-field based methods like the molecular docking to molecular dynamics to in the quantum mechanical like. This functional theory is only one level of theory. You could even go higher than that uh, if you have the resource. Uh, or, you know, you could have actually go for empirical methods such as QSR uh, or machine learning, which are, uh, you know, uh, more and more like a, a black box type of, uh, which are, you know, very nifty calculators, which are quite accurate, but, uh, you know, just by, um, you know, practicing machine learning, hello, you probably don't get a, a very good idea of what's going on at the moment. But, uh, but when you couple machine learning with any other techniques, you actually get a lot more uh, idea of what. So therefore, uh, you know, uh, the diversity of these tools, actually, uh, they utilize the classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, uh, the statistical uh, mechanics, and then uh, the computer algorithms, which tells you in doing a machine learning. So each of these methods are not applicable at all times. Uh, so you need to actually choose the appropriate technique, which is which will solve the problem you have at hand. Okay. So uh, how to choose the appropriate technique? This is what we call the fastest for position. Meaning, what is fit for a particular purpose? Okay. You should always ask yourself. And what are the three main parameters that will uh, help you to actually identify that? Number one, speed of the uh, calculation, okay, uh, which directly comes into the cost because the more is the computational cost, the more, uh, you know, it kind of uh, adds up like that. Uh, number two, uh, predictive ability. So what is the benefit by doing this particular thing? Okay. So for example, sometimes if you do a longer duration simulation, but you get a better predictive ability. So that's what we actually call the, like all, like 
in all matters of life, we always do a cost benefit analysis. Now, this cost benefit needs to go hand in hand with the other vertex of the triangle uh, about how, how it is actually impactful to the program. It is very, very important to actually uh, stay uh, in the impact circle of the program. Make sure that what you are doing is actually impacting. So, therefore, a, 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 a very you know, reasonable assessment of these three factors before you are actually doing any particular economic study help you to actually become a more exact uh, in your program, right? So with that, uh, let me come into some of the uh, case studies of how uh, either I have used or how I have seen, obviously, uh, one hour is not a, a, not a time where I can do just to each of these things, although I could actually pick up uh, examples for each of these techniques, but uh, obviously I'm not complaining that I got them but uh, uh, you know, one of the first times, so I'd like to give you a clip of how uh, a, you know, some of these uh, have been used uh, successfully in uh, drug discovery. And then uh, I encourage you to go and, uh, you know, find out on your own about, uh, uh, from the literature, about how other techniques have been uh, useful uh, in drug discovery. For example, uh, they talked a lot about uh, the ICP technique and uh, how uh, they have been able to do that with that. So I, I won't be actually uh, talking about that. I have not practiced uh, a lot of it. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I will talk about other aspects in the context of uh, the history programs that I have uh, worked on. Okay. Uh, and later, actually, a couple of techniques I will uh, present them through uh, literature history. So the first one is actually uh, an IRAC for inhibitors for the uh, story. Uh, for, uh, the discovery of uh, IRAC4 inhibitors. Right? Uh, the, the problem at hand here was the optimization of potency and uh, selectivity of uh, IRAC4 inhibitors. Uh, analysis of the heterocycles which were used in that particular program, uh, and then how uh, we utilized uh, the structural information to analyze the kind of selectivity of these compounds. And to get a short case study of this, and then we'll move on to other things. So whatever I am talking about here is actually uh, has been revealed in this particular uh, publication. Uh, we had earlier this year in the ACS computers from you know this is my paper. So uh, it is actually all covered in that if you want to go and be interested to go. So uh, this is a jump. I am not actually going uh, to present a full uh, case study uh, of uh, what we did in that program, how the SAR and all that, uh, since, uh, and I have given this talk in the drug history hackathon happened, that happened uh, some time back, uh, and I am actually differently formulating this talk uh, for this particular uh, uh, audience and the uh, title that they chose. Right? So, therefore, uh, I'll be talking about it in a different size here. So let's start uh, straight away with a lead compound that we got in this, which is actually what we call the compound number 12. So uh, this compound number 12, this is how it actually binds to the uh, IRAC code uh, active site. It's a nicotinamide, uh, the pyridine and nitrogen interacting with the NGG and the NGG5. Okay. And then uh, we have a benzophile rule on this, uh, which is uh, making a stacking interaction with tyrosine, a pi pi stacking. Then we have a nicotinamide uh, where the nicotinamide NNC is interacting with the extended range with the carbonyl here. And then we have a tertiary alcohol here uh, which, uh, which uh, interacts with the unique front pocket of uh, IRAC4. Mm -hmm. I think in the next slide I'll be talking about why the IRAC4 front pocket is uh, very unique and how uh, we are doing a help by that. So this this is a uh, reasonably it's a very important compound I have. And I had four, we had a series of compounds uh, in this paper. And this is about uh, you know two nanometer compounds. Yeah, and uh, I hope uh, you have some understanding of what is that you see. So this is actually known as the ambient selectivity. Okay, ambient selectivity uh, actually means they have a kind of panel, uh, ambient kind of selectivity. So the ambient selectivity index is known as. And on that kind of panel of about 400 uh, different kind of uh, is what we tested in this uh, case. Um, uh, no, uh, on how many kind of uh, we have a 
an activity remaining of 33% upon treating with one micromolar of the compound. Okay, divided by total number of candidates. So essentially, uh, even if you don't understand it, uh, understand the details of that, uh, all it says is that this number says one percent of the kinome uh, you are inhibiting. Okay, so in this particular case, you are inhibiting only one point seven percent of the kinome, which is actually pretty predictable. That means if you take about four hundred kinases, you are hitting uh, these kinases uh, only about one point seven percent. That translates to about seventeen. Eight, right? So 6.8 candidates, about 7 candidates we are uh, inhibiting somewhat, somewhat uh, very importantly. Right? So this is a very good number, uh, excellent selectivity for this compound and also uh, excellent potency. So what was wrong with this? So this even uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, gave us the proof of concept uh, in the animal model of uh, uh, murine inflammation model we were actually working in. Neurology program here. Uh, so we had the LTA induced acute neurine information model, and this compound was actually showed the dose dependent inhibition of uh, IL6 release. So uh, the IRAC4 inhibition is actually connected to IL6 release. So upon IRAC4 inhibition, we should actually see IL6, uh, less release of the IL6 cytokine. So some actually satisfied our goal uh, for 10 to 25 meg per kg, 250 meg per kg, we had a dose dependent inhibition of uh, IL-6 feeling. Uh, however, uh, you know, uh, we, could actually, we could actually progress uh, well. That, that was because, uh, you know, there was a soft spot in this benzothiazole uh, 2 position was actually a soft spot. So we were not getting adequate exposure of this particular compound. And so therefore, what uh, what wants to be done is that uh, when the, retaining the rest of the compound, we actually wanted to uh, do a heterocycle campaign here. As I told you here, uh, we needed the heterocycle in this series here because of the stacking with the tyrosine uh, 262. So therefore, we have to get a heterocycle uh, campaign to replace this particular heterocycle. Right? So uh, here is what I mentioned about uh, how the tertiary alcohol was there in the uh, front pocket, okay, that was actually helping. Uh, there are two pictures here, the left hand side picture is actually showing you uh, the general kinase structure where it is represented by an uh, LCK kinase where the pocket is actually highly solvent exposed. On the right hand side, however, you have the IRAC4 kinase, you can, you can actually see this big pillar which is standing here, okay. So this is uh, because of an additional loop in IRAC4 kinase, what we call the Selman loop, uh, that is actually giving a different architecture to the front pocket. And also, compared to the other uh, kinases, it is making the IRAC4 kinase somewhat more hydrophobic. So in a very subtle manner, you know, uh, the tertiary alcohol actually uh, uh, acted more uh, because it has a gem diameter group which is heterotopic in nature. So that was more tolerated in IRAC4 as opposed to other kinases with, uh, which are highly solid okay. So therefore, uh, we uh, kind of uh, understood that uh, that's, the, that's, the way, that's the reason why we were getting selectivity with this uh, tertiary alcohol uh, based, uh, you know, hydrophobic group in the front pocket in IRAC4 against uh, other kinases. Okay. Now, I, I would like to clarify here, this is a qualitative understanding. Uh, you might go and dump these two compounds, this compound on LCK and IRAC4, and it's possible that uh, you might get very similar ducking scores. So, therefore, two things to caution there. Don't rely on ducking scores, okay? uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, solution effects the ligand has are actually very poorly uh, uh, taken into account in any, uh, you know, uh, a computation of okay. So, therefore, any protein ligand uh, binding event is an interplay between the ligand, the protein, and the solvent. Okay. And although we have a number of tools uh, these days, uh, every vendor has their own tools uh, to actually uh, identify the, some college hot water. Some call it unhappy water, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, um, uh, we just give you again a quality to understand about what are the sites in the protein uh, that uh, can take a polar interaction as opposed to what are the sites which could take a non-polar interaction. Okay. So that's where it ends. Although, like, uh, uh, they do estimate a data, 
it's not always very, uh, it doesn't always translate, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a linear fashion into your molecules when you actually build it very quickly. So, therefore, uh, there's a word of caution. There's no reason to not do those, but, uh, uh, you know, you should not change uh, the scores that you get out of it. You should actually use it for, uh, you know, uh, very good gaining, good qualitative understanding of the system. And then uh, see it in conjunction with the SAR that is already available uh, in your program so that, uh, you know, uh, you can make more meaningful designs going forward. Okay. So this is a lesson here. The topics are not informative as a, uh, and uh, what I have offered here is a, a qualitative uh, explanation. Now let's come back to the hydrocycling campaign that we talked about. So if you look at the densifiable uh, tyrosine uh, stacking, okay, this was pretty compelling for us to believe that uh, you know it's required. Although there are a lot of other Iraq for inhibitors and competitors which uh, do not have this particular thing, but uh, in our system with that type of interaction and other compounds that uh, uh, it, it certainly seemed uh, uh, important to have this kind of a by stacking in fact there. And therefore, uh, as you can see, and as we talked about, the true position of the general as well was the first bit, but uh, you know, it's not getting oxidized, and that's how we are getting poorer exposures, okay, which are uh, represented by the uh, liver microsomal stability uh, here, okay. So that's how we actually made different compounds by, you know, plugging the two position of the general isole, making a thiod isole here, uh, making an oxid isole, isoxide isole actually, and isoxide isole here, and then we had a uh, you know, more different, uh, you know, um, uh, bridge heterocycles, you know, where nitrogen is the bridge first, uh, like pterosaurotidine, pterosaurotidine. So what happened here, let us see. We actually retained the whole blood interact, the whole blood potency uh, in, uh, you know, these more promising cases, uh, where uh, compared to 12, which, which had about 800 nanometer uh, potency in the whole blood, we were actually, we improved upon that, uh, it was about 340 nanomolar. The liver microsomal stability also improved uh, drastically, okay. Uh, the SPK phone selectivity was also kind of, uh, kind of dripping, uh, dropping down because with these, it was actually in the thousands of phone selectivity selected against LCK. Now, as I mentioned, LCK was a representative candidate because uh, what we generally observed was that LCK selectivity was striking with, uh, you know, general kind of selectivity. So we just, uh, you know, went with the LCK phone selectivity. And when we had this particular compound, we saw that there was a significant erosion of the uh, LCK selectivity. Yes. Okay. And uh, even more so, the CK phone selectivity rapidly dropped. And that kind of, uh, so from, with this compound 17, we were hitting about 1% of the kind of, while the compound 20, we were hitting about 8% of the kind of. Now that translates about 30 to kinase. Now, what if some of these kinases were bad players and, you know, by inhibiting them, we could easily get caught. Okay. So therefore, uh, this was a uh, situation uh, that was a very uncomfortable situation. And we wanted to understand why it is happening. Now, uh, a word on, uh, no, uh, how, uh, although like uh, uh, all these heterocycles, uh, you know, the chemistry group usually came up with these heterocycles and then, uh, you know, based on uh, their own uh, synthesis ability and, uh, you know, what is the kind of the general form of code that is uh, satisfied. Uh, we in the CAD group were always, uh, you know, analyzing this with, uh, with respect to their uh, home or um, uh, densities uh, on each of the atoms in these different heterocycles. So what it told us is that because uh, the two position oxidation was a problem, uh, if you have, uh, you know, high numeric density in the two position, uh, in any position, in any of the heterocycles, that would also probably undergo oxidation or some kind of a uh, biotransformation, not giving you enough exposure. So uh, the analysis of the homolimo uh, um, uh, density from these heterocycles through what we call the FUKU indices, uh, you know, uh, which uh, kind of told us the possibility of nucleus attack like on these uh, heterocycles, also informed uh, the choice of uh, some of these uh, heterocycles, although uh, that's not what drove the choice of it. Now, uh, 
this is a kind of a plot I made up. Uh, okay, it's a kind of uh, dropping down. So what's happened is that compared to compound pulse, this is replaced by. Uh, so uh, first I want to take this to this part. The x-axis has a different kind of group. On the y-axis, uh, if a point is uh, closer to the top, that means that uh, it's not quite active on that particular tiny. Whereas if the point is way down here, that means that the compound is active on that particular tiny. Okay. So uh, this is generally to represent. You don't need to understand which tiny is being hit or which tiny is not being hit, but this is to present a global picture of uh, you know what happened when we went from compound 12 to compound 20. And I would like to remind you, compound 1 is the same compound with a densified zone in this particular case, whereas compound 20 has a pyrazonal pyramid in that case, right? So as you can uh, see, while the blue compound doesn't hit the bottom uh, very often, the, uh, uh, the orange one, which is compound 20, is hitting the uh, bottom very often, which is the same as what I said in the, uh, in the slide, in the last slide. Uh, we were hitting about 8% of the kinome, and that would well, actually, they're going down uh, more often. Now, uh, then, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult enough to design uh, for one particular canyon. Now, when you're hitting so many canyons, even if you have success on all of them, uh, you cannot actually go and find out what's happening in each of the cases. So that's when we were helped by, uh, you know, uh, this thing, CK, which are, which are the data of which I also presented in the next slide. Uh, we took seek it as a representative of the uh, time adjustment which it was hitting because what we uh, found was that uh, our compound was hitting a lot of time adjustments which had given in as a gatekeeper. Now gatekeeper, uh, I'm sure uh, most of you would be very familiar with uh, time uh, technology now. So uh, if you have the, this is what we call the hinge region where your heterocycle binds. Uh, uh, the residue which is just preceding the hinge region is actually known as a gatekeeper because hmm, it controls the uh, entry of the ligand into the deeper pocket. It actually controls how much of the deeper pocket the you have. So uh, several of the kinases which were inhibited by this 20 had actually created in as a gatekeeper. Okay? So most prominently, 20 inhibited seek it very potently. Okay, therefore we actually used the seek it as a surrogate kinase to understand what would be happening in those kinases where premium was the case. So here what you see uh, is uh, what you see in orange is actually a docking mode on uh, seek it for our compound 20, whereas what you see in lighter uh, in you know the thinner lines in green is actually the binding mode of 20 on IRAC 4. Okay, if you remember the IRAC 4. The compound, the hydrocycle actually from my kit, which was stacking the tires in there. So in case of uh, C uh we have seen that the hydrocycle actually slipped such that that the, the nitrogen which is uh, present on the pyrazolo pyrimidine nitrogen is actually making a nice hydrogen bond with the case of pyramid, uh 670 of either uh, of the C kit. Okay. So that's how while it was making the interaction, okay, this magenta uh, mode, uh, it was actually through this uh, through a strong hydrogen bond with the uh, KT of 371 of uh, and CK, it was actually uh, driving the activity uh, of these compounds on CK. And therefore, uh, by extension, we said that that's how it is driving the uh, activity on a lot of other um, kinases which contain cleanin in the same position. Now, uh, as a model, you always need to look for data and see whether, uh, you know, the data supports your hypothesis or not. So, uh, we were helped by this fact that when uh, 20 was, uh, you know, sent to ambic panel, okay, in the ambic panel, so the, if the percent activity remaining is low, that means it's very, very active. If the percent activity remaining is uh, high, then it is inactive. So you see on the kit, it is very active. That's what ambic panel also told. But when we, when we had the mutant, when the screening was actually alanine, you see this compound was inactive. Okay. So this data also supported the hypothesis that uh, it is a creonine interaction with this uh, flipped gatekeeper, which is actually causing, uh, you know, a big interaction with CK. Because CK itself was causing some toxicity in our program, 
Okay, and therefore, uh, that's what that was actually eroding the anion selectivity of this compound also. Okay, now what happened? So, in course of that, our chemist came up with a compound where they had a chlorine substitution in this particular process. Okay, and the rest of the study has to do with what happened when that chlorine substitution. So, let's come back to the SAR thing. Between 20 and 21, so these are why these compounds uh, remain more or less the same. Between 20 and 21, so when you had a chlorine, and there was, uh, there was a chlorine here and there is no chlorine here. This is from 7.8. We are back to only one percent of the time. Okay, while we retain the given microsome stability, which is what we want. We had excellent NC selectivity. We had secret selectivity also drastically improved from only eight fold to about hundred fold. Okay. We retain the whole blood activity uh, to an extent. Okay. Uh, so therefore, this was actually a, a great news in our program. And this incorporation of chlorine was actually pretty magical. So again, I am showing you a very similar plot for compound 20 and 21. In this case, uh, 20 is represented by this ion line, which is obviously the bad guy. It is falling down so often. But the compound 21 is actually not falling down that often. This is again representing that this compound had a uh, great selectivity. Now, why was it so? Okay, why was it so? We actually wanted to understand from the gas perspective, even if it was in a kind of an afterthought, Okay, isn't it, uh, you know, always understanding the data from a structural context helps you in further design. So this is where uh, we came from. So we explained the chlorine effect in this particular manner. So if you look at 21, this is the binding mode of 21 on IRAD4. As you can see, this is the chlorine that we talked about, okay? And, uh, you know, the same kind of a stacking with the tyrosine 262 gate paper of IRAD4 chlorine. In addition to a water mediate and hydrogen bond, which is always there in the uh, case of IRAC for integrators. Not only in our series, even in other series. Uh, now, this is what, for, uh, to remind you, this is the kind of a uh, binding mode of the dust chloro compound we saw on C kit. Now, when you have the chloro, uh, even on C kit, this compound actually flipped, okay, such that it actually adopted an IRAC for neck compound. So this a picture gives you the picture, picture of uh, you know how with the fluorine uh, incorporation on CK, this compound uh, has lost the hydrogen bond with CNA and also it's kind of uh, from a distance and it's actually not making very uh, pretty, uh, very productive interactions with CK in order to elevate that. Now why did this fluorine flip uh, the fluorinated hydrocycle flip as opposed to a distance of uh, hydrocycle? So, the, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the confirmation of search is actually a very, very key aspect in, uh, your, uh, in the design of small bonds. Okay. If you look at this particular compound, okay, uh, the white here, uh, the whitest one actually represents the binding mode of uh, this compound 20 on I-4, whereas the green one on C kit. Now, what happened? So, we made the dihedral drive of just the form molecule, both 20 and 21. In one case, this was a hydrogen, in the other case, this was a chlorine. And you see what the dihedral drive actually gave us. Uh, orange is actually with the uh, hydrogen, the one which is the dust flow, the 20. And you see it has a minima here. And another minima around here, which is about one and a half, uh, less than 2 kg per mole uh, difference from here. Right? Uh, from the uh, minima. Okay. And if you took 21, the pronounced minima was actually here. Okay. We are only doing a technical scan around this. So the rest of the bonds will be insane. Uh, so that's what uh, just proves us uh, our point. Okay. And you see the second minima was actually way more pronounced than the first one. Uh, you know, existing at around four and a half kg per mole. Okay. Now what happens? Your uh, IRAC code binding mode actually rests here. So that's where the uh, lowest energy is there, and that's the low energy confirmation as well as the biotic confirmation. If you took 20, uh, the secret binding mode of 20 actually rested here, okay, only about uh, one and a half kg per mole, okay. Now this energy, this difference in energy was actually funded by the Freonian gatekeeper interaction. If you actually took, uh, you know, the fluorinated version of that, the low energy actually went there. Now, oh, because of the fluorination, there was a, a clash with the gradient reposition, and this hydrogen bond was no longer there. Okay, 
So therefore, it was no longer able to fund this huge 4 k cancer, 4 to 4 and a half k cancer multiplex, and this compound had to flip and come over here. So that's how, and this code was actually non productive on PK because we lost this interaction, and that's how uh, this uh, kind of a, you know, uh, confirmation set explains how. Uh, you know, we got uh, selectivity against ticket and then uh, and accordingly with a number of other candidates which have been in as a gatekeeper. So now, if you have to look at this in the database now, this, this would actually look like uh, what we call the molecular match page, okay? So you should actually look at this uh, paper that they said, and if you look at the data, chloro and the disfloro, it actually looks like uh, molecular match page, okay, which are just different, differing from a hydrogen to a fluorine, okay. And the kind of selectivity is actually an activity cliff surface because in one case it is 7.8 and the other case is actually only 1. Okay? So therefore, uh, this is how, uh, you know, just by doing molecular match page, you may not actually uh, get a lot of information other than the fact that, yeah, your chemistry can probably make the next compound. But when you uh, investigate the match pair in the structural context, like, you know, it is kind of doing a reverse of what I explained in now. If you do, if you go after them like that, you can actually, uh, you know, get a lot more, uh, get a lot more evidence about what's going on here at a molecular level and, uh, you know, uh, how uh, you can utilize that information further, uh, you know, in the design of compounds, like we did in this particular case. So therefore, the molecular bonding techniques that we use here are actually, uh, and uh, you know, uh, just for completeness, I would like to say that uh, 21 met some of our criteria of uh, efficacy and all that, uh, although uh, you know, it's not our uh, final compound, but uh, 21 uh, did go into what was, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, profiling uh, of efficacy and the reduction in all that. So the key techniques that we use here, therefore, are the molecular docking for potential optimization on IDAC code, also to understand, uh, you know, uh, how uh, we are potentially getting selectivity and seek it, homolubine analysis for rationalization of the uh, heterocycle, then conformational sets to explain the what are the kind of selectivity to the next that we have in this particular case. Now the second one is actually I'll touch upon uh, homology models. Okay. Again, a talk I have given in the past uh, this one uh, in March, but again I will touch upon this particular um, yeah, and I will touch upon this particular case study uh, from the point of view of how you could actually uh, use this tool of homology modeling uh, really well in the What to do? Uh, when there are no DFPR structures, DFPR out structures available for your particular panel. This is the case in point. Uh, this origin DBO farm, uh, they collaborated on this compound DBO one of four. Okay. Uh, not really interested on what happened to the compound. But if you look at the structure of this compound, uh, you know, this happened somewhere around April 2011 uh, on public domain data. Uh, you see, it's it like a very typical type 2 motif which is attached to that, okay, which is about higher than MI. Okay. Those of you who have attended my other talks uh, in other uh, forums, you would know about uh, Now, but other than around 2011, uh, Jack uh, had actually no uh, DFG out structure civilian. Okay, all the success of Jack was a DFG in. So uh, then, then just to think that maybe this compound was binding in some other way to Jack, that was actually to, uh, not to be true because uh, in about 2012, okay, uh, May 2012, actually, you know, what is of this type 2 inhibitor of Jack group, okay, is an ADAG outcome from this compound. So it's a classic example when discovery of a type 2 kinase inhibitor uh, that has the curious degree of ADAG out structure okay, in the public domain, okay. We are talking only about public data here, yes? okay, uh, let us review that we don't have access to any of this uh, proprietary data. So just speaking from a public data point of view, uh, this type 2 structure of uh, a JAK inhibitor existed even before a type 2 uh, kinase uh, confirmation, a DFG out kinase confirmation was actually available public. 
So uh, now that it means that uh, we we always have we, we cannot actually design type two inhibitors uh, in candidates where there are no type two structures available, no DNA of structures available. So that's not the case because uh, what we did uh, I and uh, uh, I have been helped on this matter uh, with my uh, through my past colleagues uh, Rashid and uh, Vadidas. Um, uh, we actually came up with a workflow. Uh, where we take the kinase domain sequence, let's say you want to uh, generate a DAT outcome from a, uh, of a particular kinase, what it looks like, and you want to understand the uh, uh, model and maybe possibly, if possible, do some So uh, you take the kinase domain sequence, blast it on the PDB, and you push the closest small log with the DAT out as template, and you can get model model with that. To dot your compounds on that and do, uh, you know, at least you dot the initial compound of that and you do an RMSD check. Okay, so this is the workflow we followed to actually validate our, uh, you know, uh, understand, uh, validate our thinking about how we can actually generate a DAT out model of uh, any kind of So the key context typical of type 2 inhibitors, they serve as guiding parameters to arrive at a bioactive combination. And of course, once you do docking again, you could do other optimizations like MNGDSA, induced with docking on that model, or you could do molecular dynamics, or you could do this It just, uh, uh, it uh, depends on the kind of a computational resource and the licensing that you have, uh, you know, to carry out any of this, right? So, we did that. And uh, to cut a long story short, uh, here are some of the examples of what we got out of it. Okay. So uh, there are uh, on some cases where we modeled the GFR on kit, the kit as the template, we got excellent results with RMSC less than one extra. And then uh, EGFR on able, we got RMSC within one to two extra. When we modeled ABL using LCK as the template, you know, we got RMSC greater. Overall, uh, uh, almost 70% of the cases we got about the uh, RMSC less than 2 axon, but again, in the more than 10 test cases we had, we got an RMSC that ranged from anywhere from 1 axon to 4 axon, which is together than 4 axon. So our learning was this, the template confirmation is actually difficult to reproduce uh, the binding mode, the known binding mode. And then you have a ligands that are large and highly flexible to actually fail. So what can we do in that in such cases? So this is where uh, you know uh, we actually took the homology out of the model part. Okay? Uh, and uh, we use the structure, the ligand structure as a page in order to identify uh, a, a another kind of okay, uh, to which a similar ligand is actually binding. And the and rest of the workflow remains same. Our thinking was uh, as follows: amino in the binding sites, they respond to structural changes of the species against by presenting an appropriate protomer of the side chain or by affecting a backbone movement. So, in other words, active sites and protein structures are actually not optimized for the ligand, but they are actually customized for the ligand uh, to which they bind. So we wanted to see, can we exploit this feature to identify an appropriate template and build a model for the target protein and expression. And a couple of examples, as you can see, these are large ligands and they also have a number of rotatable points. So if you see this particular example, this one has a rotatable point, even in this key pharmacopoeic region. So this can actually give you a hard time if you go with our first approach. So, what we did is and presenting the easier case given in the other case we were successful with that. So uh, we took uh, so this was an able ligand. Uh, we actually did a fair screen in this particular case. We were using Schrodinger tools uh, the, the, the suit actually. Uh, so we actually took this bioactive confirmation and we did a shared similarity screen of this compound on the uh, on all the kinase domain uh, ligands that we have. We got another compound which had a shape similarity of 0.7 and through that we actually got 4 CKR. This compound was bound to GDR1 kinase with this PDB ID 4 CKR. So therefore we took 4 CKR as a template and then we did the homology model of ABN. So therefore when we constructed a homology model like that, lo and behold, I wish I could uh, show you a talking picture of you know how it behaved in the first approach versus the second approach. Uh, but uh, you know, trust me, 
in the RMSC was really good in that case because we wanted to school those compounds which gave a high RMSC and then try to see how those compounds can be there better in this particular case. And you see this, uh, I don't really need to, uh, you know, tell you an RMSC because it, it, uh, it, it has a, uh, it was an excellent finding mode. It actually recapitulates all the key interactions that the, uh, that the compound is making. So I think this is a pretty uh, neat example of uh, how to actually, you know, uh, think molecularly about your, uh, uh, you know, problem at hand and then come up with uh, innovative solution. Because to my mind, uh, you know, although, uh, you know, first time I actually presented this uh, thing in 2014 in NASA, uh, and after that we actually wanted to publish this. And then uh, in, in 2015, somebody in the U.S. actually uh, City College of New York, they actually published the same uh, same approach, okay? So don't sit on your ideas for long, publish them faster, okay? Uh, but uh, I think the second approach which I talked about where we took the homology part of the homology model, I think it is uh, pretty neat and uh, it's an innovative uh, uh, contribution that we have. So the molecular modeling techniques we use in this are actually uh, a template uh, of choice we did the homology modeling and I showed you two different ways of how we actually identified the template. And then uh, we did the molecular docking, we did the digital docking, we did the molecular dynamics and we also did a shape match with the uh, existing data. So let's actually move to the uh, modeling of uh, covalent adapts. Okay. Uh, how Quantum mechanical computations can help in this covalent adapt formation. Uh, so they can actually help you in identifying soft source of uh, metabolism. They can estimate the reactivity index of a set of compounds if those compounds are highly reactive, or they can also help you in getting transition state of which the third one is actually easy to keep because uh, still they say the transition state uh, pending is actually more of an art than science. Okay. Uh, 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 but, you know, it's, it's actually pretty tricky and needs a lot of patience, a uh, lot of your jobs to get run for two, three days, they just fail, okay, and then you need to submit that again, uh, usually not practiced a lot in the industry, uh, no, but uh, it, it actually was tremendous scope. Uh, now, just to take you through the reaction coordinate, what I need is that, uh, so here is where the reactants are resting, and here is where the product is resting. And the reactants together, uh, either potential or in combination with the catalyst, catalyst, uh, catalyst they actually scale this activation barrier, and then uh, all of the, they they form the uh, product here, and then they slide down the uh, the film to go into a lower energy complex. So this difference in energy of the reactants uh, with the product is actually uh, what we call the energy of formation. Okay. If this energy of formation is uh, negative, okay, then the product formation is stable. If this fellow lies somewhere here, then those those guys can again scale back this activation barrier and go there and react it again. Okay, so if it's positive, the product formation is not much stable. If it is negative, the product formation is highly stable. And if you actually are able to implement the transition state for that, you can actually find this difference in energy of the reactants to the transition state and that's what will actually give you the activation value. Okay. You, you should go and check in the literature. There are a lot of excellent examples where people have actually found out the activation barriers. Uh, but I will present you one case study of how we actually did the very simple thing of uh, you know the energy of formation and uh, how we correlated it with um, a, a, in, in a particular case. That's what I mean. Yeah, so in other words, the heat of formation is simply the difference in the energy of the product uh, with the energy of the reactor. Whereas the activation uh, energy is actually the difference in the energy between the transition state to that of the uh, reactor. So here, uh, that uh, study, the system that we are studying, uh, this is again a published paper uh, that. Uh, I published along with the, uh, you know, the DLPK group uh, uh, where we were looking at a set of uh, uh, cyanocontaining heterocycles, the pyridazine, uh, pyrimidine, and the uh, pyridine. Okay, the three different heterocycles. 
in each case how the DSH was actually forming an edX with the nitride. So this is how the DSH edX is formed and then once this is formed this actually cyclizes into this thiazolidine uh, compound. Okay? So this is what they usually see but this is the rate limiting step. The rate limiting step is actually for the formation of this uh, edX, this thiol by attacking the uh, carbon and then uh, this EPF attack is what actually uh, you know, uh, this compound is formed. So what I simply did is that I took this edit, uh, this product, okay, I actually took only 15, I did take the other parts of the DSH because in AQM calculation you want to limit the number of atoms uh, detection possible. Uh, so I just took the 15 uh, and then uh, this, uh, and then uh, estimated the energies of the optimized reactants and the product and then uh, took a difference and also estimated the FOP functions F plus and F minus which actually indicate the electrophilicity and nucleophilicity of this of each of the atoms respectively. So quickly uh, cutting to the results. So this was, these were our eight compounds. Okay, we had the uh, experimental data. Uh, uh, so while seven and eight, which are these pyridine compounds, they form very less addict, only about three percent to nine percent addict they form. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 5 and 6 actually form a lot of adduct, which are actually the two cyanopyrimidines, uh, whereas the pyridamines actually form much less adduct, uh, uh, not much less, more compared to the uh, pyridine, but less compared to the pyridine. Okay. So we actually try to uh, explain this. So when I actually estimated the energy of formation of this, you see this plot is pretty telling. Okay, although like these are only eight compounds. But, uh, you know, the way, uh, you know, the prediction is coming with an aspect of 0.8, actually aspect is not very really, it has fewer points, but the trend is very beautifully captured, although there are only 8 compounds, the trend is actually very beautifully captured. Even more so, uh, this F plus I am indicating is that of the sign of carbon, okay? and you see F plus indicates a higher value of that uh, actually indicates that that compound is, uh, I mean that particular atom is more electrophilic whereas uh, uh, you know the a lower value indicates that compound is that that atom is less electrophilic. So uh, while these two can these two have seems to have been interchanged, uh, you know it definitely uh, predicts the cyanocarbon in case of a pyrimidine as the most electrophilic of the three. So you see these are the kind of uh, insights that you can potentially get into uh, you know. Uh, the um, uh, added formation. And I also actually attempted a um, the transition state calculation in this particular case, while I was not quite successful. Uh, this picture itself is actually gives you a lot more insight into why, how it could be happening. See so what happens uh, is actually this sulfur attacks this particular carbon, the uh, cyano uh, carbon, which is electrophilic. That hydrogen goes over to that uh, nitrogen. It becomes in. And then uh, you see this uh, distance actually starts at around 2.75 and this transition is locking to 2.5. So if I actually got the light transition state, you, uh, I will see that this is going further down and actually forming an covalent direct. Then this is becoming a double bond. So this is actually, uh, a, 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 I think, uh, even if unsuccessful, this kind of uh, uh, experiments actually give you a lot of structural insight into the problem that you are actually trying to solve. So therefore the aforementioned the techniques which are the geometry optimization of the reactions and product and estimating the energy of the formation, uh, home volume calculations and estimating the Foupe functions to identify hot uh, soft spots, uh, apprehending the transition state and estimating the energy of activation. This can be actually potentially used in the design of covalent inhibitors. Now there are a number of covalent inhibitors. Most recently, I'm sure uh, many of you would be reading about it. The uh, MPRO, the main protease of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, also has a, is actually a 15 protease. Okay? So if you want to design any covalent inhibitors uh, for that, you can actually use these techniques to actually see what the reactivity of your work is. How the size is your work in forming a covalent adduct with a particular system. Okay. Uh, apart from, so therefore these techniques can be used in the in uh, identifying and uh, designing uh, covalent inhibitors as well as reversible covalent. 
I will wind up with a couple of uh, forest case studies from uh, literature. Okay. Uh, I, I'll probably take about 10 minutes more. Uh, I think uh, I hope that's okay, Professor. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk about molecular dynamics. So this is how uh, you know your structure would actually look like. Okay? So this is actually a complex of a protein called MDM2 can come uh, bond to uh, the compound known as nutrient growth. But however, in actuality, you know, uh, it it will be looking like this. Okay? The protein has an ensemble of compounds. Okay. Uh, the ligand also has an ensemble of uh, complementary compounds. You see here in an extra structure, it's actually an average structure of this ensemble. So if, it, if you are looking at an NMR structure, this becomes a little bit more obvious, but in case of uh, extra structure, it's not very obvious. Right? So uh, we actually take, uh, you know, this kind of static structure moves to heart, and then we start, uh, you know, believing the dotted lines that our visualizing program shows, and then we go up to those. Okay? But, you know, uh, you should have this kind of a fluid situation in mind, and that's what should actually uh, tell you what could be happening in this linear program. And uh, how, uh, in this molecular, I'm not going to talk about what we do in molecular and all that, and I'm sure uh, all of you know, uh, have a very good idea of what is, what, uh, what is happening there. Uh, but, uh, you know, how you actually make sense of a, a long time scale simulation is through actually, you know, the diffusion of the individual atoms, you know, and uh, what we call the root means for displacement. What is the displacement of individual atoms uh, or a group of atoms uh, in our system? If, uh, you know, the displacements are actually huge, okay, then uh, you need to understand why they are happening. For example, if you were to take two different ligands which are bound to a protein, one which is a one micromolar ligand versus the other which is a one nanomolar ligand, you will see much less root means the displacement with a one nanomolar ligand as opposed to one micromolar ligand. So which parts of the protein are actually getting more stabilized, uh, that actually gives you an insight into how, uh, you know, you could be actually designing your compound. So, uh, Again, from the molecular dynamics uh, simulation, from the output, you actually get, uh, you know, these are the kind of parts that the Desmond gives you, you know, uh, you know where it shows you what fraction of the hydrophobic interactions are there, what are the uh, water mediated interactions, uh, you know, what are the uh, hydrogen bonding interactions. Uh, if you take this particular compound nutrient, uh, so you see, if you were to look at the static structure, you would think that the histine and the phenylalanine here, uh, and the phenyl here, the chlorophenyl here, have a high stacking interaction. But you do a long enough simulation, uh, you see that they're only for about 18% of the time. Okay? Of course, my simulation could be shorter, and these numbers might change if you actually do a longer duration simulation. In the first representative example, don't take it to uh, not too much. Okay? Um, uh, this the piperazine, okay, the piperazine on, its quantum mediated interaction, uh, you know, uh, with this uh, helix is there only about 16% of the time. So this kind of information is actually more insightful into actually designing your compounds, and you should actually only go out to those interactions which have held uh, for a longer duration of time than a shorter duration of time. So splitting hydrogen bonds you can actually uh, avoid by doing this kind of a um, uh, no, all the dynamics calculation and analyzing the results. Uh, this is very classic. This is what we do in uh, understanding the stability of interactions of the ligands. Uh, but you know, uh, using molecular dynamics to understand actually the protein dynamics okay, is actually very very interesting. And it can happen in a longer time scale simulation only. Uh, for example, I encourage you to go and read this uh, particular uh, paper. Okay, that came from. Uh, the funded group uh, in Stanford uh, about 2017. They did minuscule dynamics of uh, BTK, okay, the brutal tyrosine kinase, and which reveal kinobite conformational plasticity within the echo kinase domain. And they did it really beautifully. Uh, at that time, BTK had about 23 public domain uh, structures. In each of the structures, they actually removed the ligand. Okay, so therefore, 
what the 23 structures gave you gave them were actually uh, 23 different echo configurations. Okay, because this Daniels was definitely uh, adopting that particular confirmation which the ligands were actually tracking. Right, so that was the thinking. And then they took these 23 uh, kind of structures, which are different echo structures. And then they protonated and deprotonated the aspartic uh, acid of the DHG and made it into 46 structures and simulated each of these 46 structures into uh, uh, for about 400 nanoseconds. And because each of them were actually, uh, you know, um, each of them were, uh, what should I say, uh, echo structures, they could actually mercury with the HG because finally, they are actually trying to see only what are the type of, uh, you know, confirmation this compound is adopting, right? So they had a number of different uh, starting confirmations, echo confirmations. So by merging all these uh, uh, trajectories together, they actually came up with about 1.7 millisecond trajectory. Okay? Uh, and they used what is known as Markov set models to identify different regions in the uh, phase space and then uh, identify the transition between uh, those confirmations. Okay. Uh, and see, uh, so in their uh, uh, simulation, they actually found the various kind of confirmation which was sampled by the molecular dynamics simulation. One, so this is what is known as a heterophobic spine of the kind of uh, magenta patch that you see here. So in this, in this case, it's very intact. That means it's an active confirmation. So this can be somewhat bent. Okay, so this is what they call the spark like confirmation, and in this case, it's all uh, kind of uh, it's fragmented. So this is actually the DLT out confirmation. Okay, so uh, interestingly, if you see, uh, you know, the DLT in and out confirmation, the active and inactive confirmation, in the kind of very different structures that you see, uh, the x axis represents the uh, angle between the AT phenyl and the AT lysine. Whereas the uh, y-axis actually uh, talks about the, uh, uh, in this particular case, it will be uh, DFG uh, and the uh, DFG minus 1 and the DFG uh, as angle on the y-axis. So you see a fair amount of the distribution. So when the angle is in this region, it is actually DFG in, and the angles are in this region, these are actually the DFG out. Similar plot for the alpha C helix, uh, okay? So when you have uh, alpha C helix in this, so these are the structures which have alpha C in, and these are the structures which have alpha C out. So this is the kinoid in all the different kind of structures in the PDB. Now what they found in case of their MD output, what they found is that these are the static confirmations in the PDK. So on each of these white dot is actually representing their static confirmation. Bottom plot is for DLC, the top plot is for uh, helix C. So, see, irrespective of the static confirmation of the kinase, is actually pretty much sampling the whole phase space, whole confirmation space, much like what we see, and even more actually, much like what we see in, in this motor, kinobite is so such. Okay? So, irrespective of the static confirmation, all possible confirmation spaces were actually found in this uh, molecular dynamics study. So, uh, which actually, uh, this, so this uh, paper, if you go and read, it actually uh, talks about uh, how the protonation of the DFC as actually uh, helps. That's what is the determinant for the DFC into DFC out to the confirmation of change. That's what they talk with in this paper. But I thought that I should just give you a glimpse of, uh, you know, uh, what can be done with uh, molecular dynamics? Um, you know, some other time we can talk about it in more detail. Okay. But this is a great example of uh, you know how you study protein dynamics with your uh, uh, you know uh, through your molecular dynamics simulation. Okay. okay. So you could be saying uh, AI is the buzzword. Uh, I didn't talk about it at all. Okay. Now what about AI? Okay. Again, uh, uh, AI also has its place. Okay. Uh, if you uh, to give you a most uh, impactful uh, contribution of AI, so there is this company called Benevolent uh, Benevolent AI in uh, UK. So they actually uh, around uh, February when they found that uh, the SARS CoV two uh, you know they was actually binding to the A two protein uh, through its spike protein, which is uh, expressed in the uh, lung cells. 
they went after this uh, ASU and then they found what it was actually involved in. So they found that this is what they call the knowledge gap. Uh, they found that it was actually involved in endocytosis. And through endocytosis, then they found what are the host factors that are actually helping in the So they came up with uh, three different uh, proteins. Uh, AAK1, all of them were kind of then uh, GAK, and then uh, JAK1 or 2. Okay, so this JAK1 or 2 was actually also uh, involved in uh, cytokine signaling uh, and involved in information. So they have actually collaborated with uh, one of the own companies. Uh, so this is the paper they published in 2015. And this company had a particular compound called Directinid, which was already in the clinic, or maybe I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, because of, uh, you know, rapidly actually identifying a target which can potentially help us in this pandemic, okay? So they could rapidly actually identify JAK1 as the target, and then they could repurpose a JAK uh, uh, inhibitor, and in this case, the Directinid. They actually, so they actually took this Directinid to clinic in Italy, uh, they have published some initial clinical data up a large number of patients. So it looks interesting. I'm sure it is going forward and uh, being tested in uh, more and more number of people. But you know, this is an excellent case study for rapidly repurposing compounds and testing the hypothesis in quick time in a clinical setting. So that is really where uh, I think the power of the IML models uh, uh, lies that they can actually rapidly repurpose the drug. And after that, we can, uh, that will help us in coming back and understanding the uh, uh, pathways, the molecular features in more detail. So uh, AI is a great effort to uh, understand the molecular uh, uh, understanding to enhance our molecular understanding. So therefore, uh, to sum up actually, what is the critical part to the IND? Uh, designing of compounds, then the target uh, assay is enzymatic assay, then we have the cell-based assay, then there are key of target assays, uh, then the, the compounds go into metabolic stability, uh, then the sick inhibition, uh, permeability issues, and then they go into runs, uh, and then, uh, you know, the you know, pharmacokinetical exposure and what is the metabolic identity, metabolite identification, then the target PD, uh, efficacy, and finally the IND nomination. Each of these uh, boxes actually generates data, and that goes in six years. And this data actually goes back to the design of compounds. Okay, and uh, and then this whole process actually follows. We have more compounds in this phase. We have fewer compounds in this phase. That means fewer data in this phase. We have more data in this particular phase. Okay. So depending upon the question in hand, you should actually choose your particular tool. Okay, which will be helpful in identifying uh, compounds for that particular phase uh, of the that particular uh, problem. Okay. So that will. So this is what I call the critical part. Uh, a compound takes, a program takes to, uh, to the IND, and the more the modeler is actually invested in this critical part, the more is the recognition, the more is the impact, and uh, you know, uh, it actually uh, helps in gaining a lot more uh, credibility. So finally, uh, there is something called the hype cycle, because we talked about a lot of uh, techniques. All emerging technologies, they go, go through this hype cycle. Uh, there, you know, this is the trigger of the innovation. And then the hype, which is a feverish uh, pitch, even the management takes notice and, uh, you know, people say that that will solve all the problems. Okay, that's, a, that's what we call the peak of inflated ex, uh, expectations. And then there is a big fall, okay, such that people become non-believers, okay, we have a drop of uh, distribution, distribution. But, you know, each tool is actually unique in the way it is actually showing us the problem from a different angle. So from that particular place again, you know, the slope of enlightenment starts, and finally the tool actually matures as the narrative of uh, productivity. So therefore, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it advice, but uh, my experience has been that uh, you know, not to get too carried away by you know tools whether they are new, old, or what. Every tool has its place in our uh, toolbox, okay. And depending upon the uh, problem that we are actually trying to address. You know, the tool needs to be uh, used uh, appropriately. And then, uh, you know, there are no models who are experts in all the tools. Okay? You should actually seek out help. You should actually seek out other models who have experience in those particular tools. And then, uh, you know, try to impact, uh, you know, the push, uh, 
the problem that we are trying to understand. Uh, so therefore, uh, the last point that I mentioned is that therefore it's really important to base the choice of the tool on the scientific question at hand rather than the uh, height that uh, is possible. With that, I thank uh, Professor Hemant Jagal uh, for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we have covered almost all the tools. So, uh, there are three questions which have come, sir. Hello. Hello, uh, Professor Amin, uh, Dr. Amin. Hello. I'm sorry, I took uh, some of your time. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right, sir. <laughs> but it was a highly informative lecture. I think covered almost all the tools, like from the beginning molecular modeling to the AI to the system. There are three questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, although it has been asked before, in your opinion, how much importance should be given to docking scores? Uh, uh, not much. Not much. If you if you want me to put a number, maybe you can give out 25% uh, weightage there. Okay, the key thing is to actually look at the, the confirmation that the ligand is uh, adopting there. Okay, in the uh, the dark pole, what is the kind of the confirmation that is adopting? And uh, um, in that particular confirmation, okay, you should look at the diagonals. For example, uh, you know sometimes the docking because see a docking program is trying to optimize the docking score. Okay, therefore, uh, although it is penalizing the bad confirmations to an extent, look, they can actually escape it because in, the optimi in optimizing the docking score, you can actually, uh, you know, select a confirmation that is actually, you know, uh, not uh, quite uh, possible to be adopted. For example, let's take, uh, let's say, in order to, uh, by rewarding the docking score, it is picking a system I. So you should actually use your judgment and say that never I cannot be this. Okay, therefore, it, it is actually something wrong. And then uh, irrespective of the talking story, you should be there. Therefore, uh, then you will ask the question, then how to actually identify the good talking That is where you need to uh, see a lot of structure, a lot of crystal structure. Okay? And then uh, what are the type of interactions, what are the type of confirmation, what are the confirmation differences of a different uh, functional group. Okay? There are enough papers on that. Uh, so I think uh, docking scores uh, should be taken with a uh, more than a bit of something. <laughs> Secondly, how different docking scores, uh, how different docking scores should be to achieve the selectivity? Uh, no, I think uh, that's. Uh, so I think uh, this question came from you said that the dynamics were there, right? I think yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. SEK and direct score, yeah. No, no, I don't think you should base your selectivity considerations on docking scores at all. Okay? That should, uh, uh, you should have a more qualitative understand from what your SAR is saying, okay? And then uh, you should take a, uh, I mean, at least in my experience, it is, uh, it can be pretty um, hazard of CQ where to, you know, <laughs> talk about selectivity <laughs> from docking scores. And third question is, uh, should we always go for DMT out or PDD in case of kinases? There is nothing like that because there are enough bad uh, inhibitors which are DMT out binders. Okay. It's just that it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, problem to have because the DMT out uh, success will have a different form of energy about it. They have a little bit slower on road, on rate, but also they have a equally uh, slower off rate because of which they keep the kinase inhibited for a longer time. Okay, they are characterized by their long resistance time on the kinase, which uh, hopefully actually impacts the pharmacology of the kinase. Okay, so therefore in a program, if you are looking for something like that, if you are looking for a differentiated pharmacology as opposed to a DFG in type of a compound, then maybe you should go for it. Uh, I mean, the case I made was not for actually always making DFG out uh, inhibitors. <laughs>
Yeah, it keeps very case by case actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. We need to completely uh, be in tune with uh, what the drug is for 18 points. Okay, what uh, yeah. what is actually the target product profile. Okay, and then we should actually accordingly choose that robot can use it. So these three questions are there. Thank you very much, sir. We have covered a lot of uh, <laughs> tools and other things. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. Thank Thanks you. Once again, uh, I apologize to Dr. Alpesh for taking his time. And uh, anybody, you can pitch me on my on the context that I provided if you have other questions to uh, ask. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So the next speaker uh, for today, for the last speaker, uh, Dr. Alpesh Malde. Dr. Malde, often he is a B farm. He was a gold medalist in B farm. Uh, 2000 and PhD uh, with Professor Ivan Sudino, who is going to speak tomorrow from Bombay College of Pharmacy. And he did his, he did his, uh, his master's again with Walter from Michael Mohan with Professor Bhartam. So he joined the University of Queensland, Australia, and obtained Australian uh, Research Council for the Fellowship in 2009, followed by Early Career Research Award 2011 and Early uh, uh, Research Kit. Research speech at fellowship in 2010 and 11. In 2011, Dr. Malde co founded and co developed the automated topology builder with Professor Udan E. Mark. The ATD, and that is the automatic, automated topology builder, has over 12,000 registered users worldwide and the repository contains 450,000 molecules. In 2018, Dr. Malde founded Malde T Scientific. Computational web design consulting. He has co authored over 50 peer reviewed research papers in the areas of computational web design. Currently, he is uh, a research fellow at the Institute for Glycomics, Griffith University, Australia, and leads the computational chemistry team focusing on the development and validation of computational methods, force field for parameters, and their applications in structure requirement and design. Dr. Alpesh is going to speak. Uh, on understanding how a drug binds to its target at an atomic level. So, uh, Dr. Alpesh, please. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Hammond, for hello. introducing me. Uh, <laughs> now, just uh, switch to the sharing the screen. Um, Uh, 